Welcome back to Principles of Macroeconomics. This is Professor Bradbury. Today we will be discussing Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is Interdependence and the Gains from Trade. In this chapter, we'll look to answer the following questions. Why do people and nations choose to be economically interdependent? How can trade make everyone better off? What is absolute advantage? What is comparative advantage? How are these concepts both similar and also different? You may want to have a calculator with you for this chapter. We're going to be running some numbers. A piece of paper and a pen would also be helpful. When you think about it, Every day you rely on many people from all around the world, most of whom you will never meet. These global supply chains provide you with the goods and services that constitute your standard of living. It's a whole interdependent network of production and distribution that brings all the goods and services that we enjoy to our doorstep. One of our 10 principles of economics was that trade can make everyone better off. We're now going to learn why people and nations choose to be interdependent and how they can gain from trade. We're going to use a simplified model. Our example is going to include just two countries. We'll have the U.S. and Japan. And just two goods, computers and wheat. We'll assume that computers and wheat can be produced from only one resource. We'll use labor as that critical input, and we'll measure the input in terms of hours. We're going to look at how much of both these goods, wheat and computers, that each country could produce, and also how much they could consume. We'll look at it underneath two different examples. One if the country chooses to be self-sufficient and cut off from trade, producing and consuming only what it can produce domestically. And in the second example, we'll think about what the country can consume if it trades with other countries. Keep in mind that we're economists here, so we're thinking that more consumption brings more utility. Keep in mind also that when goods are in greater abundance, they tend to be cheaper and more accessible. Both of these facts help explain why trade can make countries better off. It raises the standard of living. Let's move forward to our example. In chapter two, you looked at the production possibilities frontier, and now we're going to build a production possibilities frontier for the United States. The U.S. is assumed to have 50,000 hours of labor. Producing one computer is going to cost 100 hours of labor. Producing one ton of wheat will cost 10 hours of labor. Let's go ahead and use these figures to figure out all of the combinations of computers and labor that the U.S. could possibly produce given its 50,000 hours of inputs. One of the ways to do this is to pick your endpoints. Um, assume that absolutely no labor is devoted to the production of, say, computers, and that all labor is devoted to the production of wheat. It takes 10 hours to produce a ton of wheat, if the U.S. uses all of its labor to produce wheat, then it will produce 50,000 divided by 10, 5,000 tons of wheat. We can mark that out on the vertical axis. The intercept on the vertical axis is 5,000. The U.S. requires 100 hours of labor to produce a computer. If the U.S. uses all of its labor to produce computers, 
then it will produce 50,000 divided by 100, 500 computers. The horizontal intercept will be 500 computers. Going through these steps helps us to draw the production possibilities frontier. We're assuming that the trade-off is going to be linear. The slope will be uh, constant throughout the entire PPF. If we suppose that the U.S. uses half of its labor hours to produce each of our goods, computer and wheat, 25,000 labor hours will be devoted to production of computers, and 25,000 labor hours will be devoted to the production of wheat. This being the case, the U.S. will be able to produce 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat. This amount of production and consumption is what is possible for the U.S., if they were to be entirely self-reliant. Now, of course, the U.S. could choose any combination of wheat and computers that exists along the PPF. If they were choosing a combination of wheat and computers inside the PPF, they would be operating inefficiently and consuming a combination of wheat and computers that is outside the PPF is at the moment impossible. The U.S. just doesn't have enough inputs to consume outside of the PPF. Now that we've done the U.S. production possibilities frontier, let's move ahead and derive Japan's PPF. We're going to need to know how many resources are available as inputs in Japan. Remember, we're using solely labor. Japan has 30,000 hours of labor available for production each month. You'll notice that Japan has fewer resources for production than did the United States. If Japan wants to produce a computer, this requires 125 hours of labor. Keep in mind, it costs the United States 100 hours of labor to produce a computer. It looks like it takes Japan more inputs to produce a computer. Producing a ton of wheat requires 25 hours of labor. For the United States, it required only 10. For both computers and for wheat, it costs the U.S. fewer labor hours to produce a single unit. The United States, in the production of computers and wheat, is more productive. It gets more output per unit of input. This will become an important point as we move forward. Let's go ahead and graph Japan's PPF. Can you do it? Pause the video, give it a shot. We have computers on the horizontal ac axis. If Japan uses all of its 30,000 labor hours to produce computers, it will have 240 computers. The calculation is as follows, 30,000 divided by 125 hours per computer equals 240 computers. We can do the same calculation for the vertical intercept. It takes 25 hours to produce a ton of wheat. We've got 30,000 hours. 30,000 divided by 25 provides us with 1,200 tons of wheat. Let's pause for a second and look at the properties of Japan's PPF. Particularly, let's go ahead and calculate the slope of the PPF. Now, clearly the slope is negative, and the slope is giving us the opportunity cost of whatever good is on the x-axis. Here, on the x-axis, we have computers. Now, if we think about it, it requires 125 hours to produce a computer. If we're going to pull those hours out of wheat production, how many units of wheat will we give up? Wheat requires 25 hours to produce a single unit. We will have to give up 5 units of wheat in order to acquire 
the 125 hours that are required to produce a single computer. That's one way of thinking about it. The slope here is negative 5. What that is saying is that to move along the x-axis, one unit, we move down the y-axis by five units. Another way of saying this is that in order to get a computer, you have to give up five tons of wheat. And yet another way of saying this is that the opportunity cost of computers, what you must give up to get something, well, the opportunity cost of computers here is five tons of wheat. Put another way, if Japan wants to buy computers from itself, it'll have to pay five tons of wheat. If you understood that, could you answer the question, what is the opportunity cost of wheat? It takes 25 hours to get a ton of wheat and 125 hours to get a computer. We're going to have to give up one-fifth of a computer in order to free up those 25 hours of labor that are required to produce a ton of wheat. The opportunity cost of a ton of wheat is one-fifth computer. If Japan were to buy wheat from itself, it would have to pay or give up a fifth of a computer. Another way of thinking about it is that the opportunity cost of the good on the y-axis is the reciprocal of our slope. Our slope was negative 5, and the reciprocal of that will be negative 1 fifth. Suppose Japan is self-reliant entirely, and that it uses half of its labor to produce each good. It will have 15,000 hours to produce computers and wheat, and if it uses those, it will acquire 120 computers and 600 tons of wheat. This is the consumption that's possible without trade for Japan. Again, Japan could consume anywhere along that PPF. Reviewing what we've done so far, we have consumption with and also without trade. Without trade, the U.S. consumers get 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat. Japanese consumers were getting 120 computers and 600 tons of wheat. We'll compare consumption without trade, which is what we've established so far, to consumption with trade. But first, we need to see how much of each good is produced and traded by our two countries. Suppose the U.S. produces 3,400 tons of wheat. You may recall that the U.S. needs 10 hours of labor to produce each ton of wheat. And so, 3,400 multiplied by 10 gives us 34,000 labor hours that would be required to produce the 3,400 tons of wheat. The United States has 50,000 labor hours in total, and now it's used 34,000 of them to produce wheat. The United States has 16,000 labor hours remaining. You may recall that the U.S. requires 100 hours of labor to produce each computer. How many computers can the United States make with its remaining 16,000 labor hours? If you answered 160 computers, you would be correct. If we suppose that Japan produces 240 computers, how many tons of wheat would be available for production in Japan? Recall that Japan requires 125 hours to produce a single computer. 240 multiplied by 125 is 30,000 labor hours. Producing 240 computers completely exhausts all of the labor resources available in Japan, and they won't be able to produce any wheat. Here we have Japan specializing 
in the production of computers. We'll want to discover why Japan specializes in computers and why the United States ends up specializing in wheat, especially since it was cheaper for the U.S. in terms of raw labor inputs to produce both wheat and computers. This is the kind of mystery and beauty of the benefits from trade. Here we've graphed out the solutions to what we've done on the previous slide. Producing 3,400 tons of wheat requires 34,000 labor hours. The remaining 1,600 produce computers, and we have 160 computers. Here we've solved for Japan's production under specialization. 240 computers requires all of Japan's 30,000 labor hours. Japan produces no wheat. We found the two countries specializing in producing. Now let's let them trade. Some terminology you're going to need to know regarding trade is imports and exports. And export are goods produced domestically and sold abroad. To export a good means to sell domestically produced goods to another country. Imports are goods produced abroad and sold domestically. To import a good means you purchase the good produced in another country. Let's look at the consumption for the U.S. and Japan, assuming that they trade. Let's go ahead and suppose that the U.S. exports 700 tons of wheat and Japan exports 110 computers to the United States. Japan will be importing 700 tons of wheat and we'll export 110 computers. Note that when Japan purchased wheat from itself without trade, it paid one-fifth of a computer. Thus, it gave up 0.2 computers for every ton of wheat that it purchased from itself. Here, with trade, Japan gives up 110 computers to purchase 700 tons of wheat. 110 divided by 700 is 0.157. With trade, Japan is able to purchase wheat at a price of 0.157 computers. It's found a way to purchase wheat more cheaply than from buying it from itself. Let's plot out what production and consumption will be now that we've got the trade taking place and that you've got an idea of the prices we've established. The United States produced 160 computers and 3,400 tons of wheat. It then imported 110 computers from Japan but it didn't import any wheat. However, it did export 700 tons of wheat in order to purchase those 110 computers. When the United States purchased computers from itself, it cost 10 tons of wheat. When the U.S. purchases computers from Japan, it costs only 6.36 tons of wheat. Here again, the U.S. has found a way to purchase computers more cheaply through trade than by buying it from themselves. Overall, the amount consumed is 270 computers and 2,700 tons of wheat. If we plot that point out, we find that it's on the outside of the production possibilities frontier. The United States is now consuming at a level that was previously impossible if we relied on domestic production alone. Here, 
trade has clearly made the U.S. consumer better off. Japan specialized completely in computers, producing 240 of them, and produced no wheat. It decided to import 700 tons of wheat, and it paid for that wheat by exporting 110 computers. At the end of the day, Japan now has 130 computers and 700 tons of wheat. When we plot that point on the PPF, you can see it plotted by the blue dot there, we see that it's true for Japan as well. They are producing on their PPF at the red dot, but they're consuming at a point that was previously impossible beyond their PPF. Japan is clearly benefiting from trade here. Both countries are gaining from trade. If we look at the amount of consumption without trade and compare it to the consumption with trade, we find that for both wheat and computers, for both categories, consumers now have more goods available. For instance, the United States, when it was producing in isolation, could only produce 250 uh, computers. After trade, they are now consuming 270 computers. This has been a gain of 20 computers. Japan also experienced gains from trade. Now, this is interesting because the U.S. had more labor hours, and it cost them fewer labor hours to produce both wheat and computers. How is it that both countries are able to gain from trade? One term you need to be very familiar with is absolute advantage. Absolute advantage is the ability to produce a good using fewer inputs than any other producer. Let's look at the United States. We can say that they have an absolute advantage in the production of wheat. This is because producing wheat requires only 10 labor hours in the U.S. and 25 labor hours in Japan. You might think that if a country has an absolute advantage in a good, it should specialize in that good and then trade for gains. But if you recall, the United States had an absolute advantage in the production of both goods. For instance, to produce computers, the U.S. required only 100 units of labor, and Japan required 125. Let's explore these gains from trade more deeply. Absolute advantage is a little bit like absolute cost. It's the productivity. It's how many labor hours are required to produce something. But economics is about choice, and so we study opportunity cost. If we were to make the mistake of thinking that absolute cost or absolute advantage was the source of gains from trade, well, we wouldn't have much to go on here because, well, the United States has an absolute advantage in the production of computers, and yet our gains from trade arose when Japan was specializing in computers. So why does Japan specialize in computers, and yet still both countries gain from We need to broaden our understanding of cost. We have, in fact, got two measures of the cost of a good. Two countries can gain from trade when each specializes in the good that it produces at the quote-unquote lowest cost. Absolute advantage measures the cost of a good in terms of the inputs required to produce it, sort of an explicit cost. But there's another measure of cost, and this is opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is what you must give up in order to get something. In our example, the opportunity cost of a computer is the amount of wheat that could be produced using the labor needed to produce one computer. It's the amount of wheat that you must give up to free up enough labor to produce a computer. Opportunity cost and comparative advantage. The second terminology you need to know is comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the ability to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost than another producer. Which country has the comparative advantage in the production of computers? To answer this, we must determine the opportunity cost of a computer in each country. The opportunity cost of a computer is 10 tons of wheat in the United States because producing one computer requires 100 labor hours.
These 100 labor hours must be taken out of wheat production, and when you take 100 labor hours out of wheat production, you lose 10 tons of wheat. Keep in mind also that the slope of our PPF was negative 10. Five tons of wheat in Japan is the comparative advantage because producing one computer requires 125 hours. These 125 hours could be used to produce five tons of wheat. We've got to free up 125 labor hours to produce one computer. In doing so, we lose five tons of wheat. You may recall that the slope of Japan's PPF was negative five. Because Japan gives up fewer tons of wheat to produce one computer, Japan has a lower opportunity cost of producing computers. Otherwise spoken, Japan has a comparative advantage in the production of computers. If the U.S. buys computers from itself, it gives up 10 tons of wheat. When Japan buys computers from itself, it gives up only 5 tons of wheat. Absolute advantage is not necessary for comparative advantage. Comparative advantage in trade. The gains from trade arise from comparative advantage. Keep that distinction firm in your mind. These are differences in opportunity cost. When each country specializes in the good in which it has a comparative advantage, total production in all countries is higher, the world's economic pie gets bigger, all countries gain from trade. As the economic pie gets bigger, there is more plenty, less shortage, and as a consequence, prices tend to fall and goods become more accessible, raising standards of living in both countries. The last bullet point. The same concept applies to individual producers, like, say, a farmer and a rancher, specializing in different goods for which they have a comparative advantage. Keep in mind, we made a lot of assumptions in this model. It was very simplified, and trade can be a very complicated field of study. We made a lot of assumptions about the quantities of each good that each country would produce, the trades that they would make, the prices at which they would trade. In the real world, these quantities and prices wouldn't just be assumed, they'd be determined by the preferences of customers and the technology and resources in both countries. For now, our goal was to prove to you the fundamental principle that trade can make everyone better off. I hope you've been interested by this topic and decide to pursue the nuances of trade more completely in your later studies, perhaps taking an international trade course or international economics course. In summary, the interdependence and trade between countries allows everyone to enjoy a greater quantity and variety of goods and services. Comparative advantage means being able to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost. Absolute advantage means being able to produce a good with fewer inputs. When people or countries specialize in goods for which they have a comparative advantage, the economic pie grows and trade can make everyone better off. This concludes your Chapter 3, Interdependence and the Gains from Trade. We'll see you next time for our next lecture. Have a beautiful day, everyone.